We're somewhat in the back, uh, not the best, most visible location, but uh, those who uh, are interested do uh, end up finding us. We're directly behind Old Poway Market there. We're open four days a week, Thursday, Friday, and Sunday from 11 to 4, and Friday or Saturdays we're open from 10 to 4. Uh, we're very modest. We ask for a $2 admission, but fortunately most of our patrons who come are so thrilled with the museum, they end up leaving a nice donation that helps keep us going. So that's a little bit about the museum. But a museum is just a thing, and just like I'm sure the Rancho Bernardo Historical Society, it's really made up of people, people who are passionate about the same thing. And these are the few of the people who are passionate about what we do. And as you can see, we all like to have fun. This is our entry in the Poway Days uh, Parade. And you can see there's probably more adults there than kids because we all still like to have fun. So, what is play? Uh, play is generally defined in most dictionaries as to engage in activities with no apparent practical purpose other than for recreation, enjoyment, or amusement. No purpose. Well, how important can play be with a definition like that? No purpose. But as I said, the reality is play is universal. It's a bond we have across all mankind, regardless of nationality, regardless of age. This is a common thing that binds us. And I'm going to show you a little video that says this goes beyond just people. This goes out in nature, the spirit of play. What we also know from research is that play is the foundation of learning in children. Think back to your own little kids. That time uh, one of you blew a raspberry on that baby's belly, you were engaging in play with that baby. When you were teaching that baby how to say itsy bitsy spider on its fingers or toes, you were teaching all through play. Play is the very foundation of learning in children. What the research also shows is children need to play in order to develop various skills, and it also helps kids relieve stress. And stress on our children today is even higher than it was when I was a kid, when you were kids. There's so much pressure on them to succeed. So play becomes even more important in our children today. And the last point is that play remains important to us throughout our lives, even as we are into our adulthood. Uh, there. So this is something I want you to think about here. Hopefully all of you will find a way to play and get a little more enjoyment back in your life. So what drove us? We're going to show you a little video, and I apologize we don't have the speaker set up, but this gentleman right here, Stuart Brown, he's a noted PhD psychologist. This book really helped shape what our museum is about. Um, and his research into play didn't start with play in mind. His research actually started by looking at serial murderers and convicted murderers and convicts of all sorts. He would look at them and develop these analysis of what happened to them as kids, and he found a common theme, and that was that many of these kids were play deprived. Might be that they lived in households that were abusive, or otherwise they just didn't get to play. Now, he's not saying there's a one-to-one -one correlation, but he says there is a correlation. So that is something that really helped shape our museum. I'm going to play this video, and I apologize if the audio is really quiet, but if necessary, I'll speak through. Here we go, a flyby of play. It's got to be serious if the New York Times puts a cover story of their February 17th Sunday magazine about play. At the bottom of this, it says it's deeper than gender, seriously but dangerously fun, and a sandbox for new ideas about evolution. Not bad, except if you look at that cover, what's missing? You see any adults? Well, let's go back to the 15th century. This is a courtyard in Europe and a mixture of 124 different kinds of play. All ages, solo play, body play, games, taunting, and there it is. And I think this is a typical picture of what it was like in a courtyard then. I think we may have lost something in our culture. So I'm gonna take you through what I think is a remarkable sequence. 
North of Churchill, Manitoba, in October and November, there's no ice on Hudson Bay, and this polar bear that you see is 1,200-pound male. He's wild and fairly hungry. And Norbert Rossing, a German photographer, is there on scene making a series of photos of these huskies who are tethered. And from out of stage left comes this wild male polar bear with a predatory gaze. Any of you have been to Africa or uh, had a junkyard dog come after you, there is a fixed kind of predatory gaze that you know you're in trouble. But on the other side of that predatory gaze is a female husky in a play bow wagging her tail. And something very unusual happens, that fixed behavior which is rigid and stereotyped and ends up with a meal, changes. And this polar bear stands over the husky, no claws extended, no fangs, taking a look, and they begin an incredible ballet. A play ballet. This is in nature. It overrides the carnivorous nature and what otherwise would have been a short fight to the death. And if you'll begin to look closely at the husky that's bearing her throat to the polar bear and look a little more closely, they're in an altered state. They're in a state of play. And it's that state that allows these two creatures to explore the possible. They are beginning to do something that neither would have done without the play signals. And it is a marvelous example of how a differential in power can be overridden by a process of nature that's within all of us. Now, how did I get involved? So that there is a definite <coughs> example of just how powerful play can be. So if we go back to that definition, is play important? Play is very, very important here. Some other facts, as I said, how did, how did uh, Dr. Stuart Brown get involved in this? Back in 1966, there was the Texas Power Massacre. He was engaged by the governor of Texas, asked to understand why did this happen. He started by looking at Charles Whitman and his life, and his seemingly ordinarily, ordinary young man. But as we look back at his uh, upbringing, he was severely played and cried. Dr. Brown went on to study over 6,000 other cases, and he found this correlation and this link, and Dr. Brown has gone on to form the National Institute of Play. And we, as a part of the museum network, take this to heart, and that's what we try to embody in our museum, this notion that play is critically important to who we are as people. Some other things that Dr. Brown uh, found is that in the instance of animals, usually um, they only develop these extensive nerve connections up through a juvenile age. But in humans, it's been found that our brains can continue to evolve much well beyond our adolescence. This is why it's important for us all to be engaged in play, even as we get older. The executive center of the brain continue to undergo changes into the 20s, but they don't stop evolving thereafter. So the research shows that the older we get, the more we stay engaged in simple things like even doing puzzles, doing the daily crossword puzzle. It helps with the elasticity <coughs> of the brain, maintaining the elasticity of the brain there. So, other news. Pediatricians are now starting to warn their parents, limit their screen time for their kids. Today when we mm -hmm. see kids playing, this is how we see them playing more often than not. And it's not that we are against electronic devices. They offer a lot of great things for our kids, but it's really about variety. We heard Dr. Brown in his speech talk about 124 different types of play. We've distilled that down to five, and we're going to talk about five types of play today. And it's important to get our kids to be engaged in all the different types of play that we can here. What they're seeing is, if this is the only way they play, it turns into social development problems, and we see kids that behave like this. There's definitely a correlation. So, other findings are, is studies have been conducted, and we're seeing that schools across America are now actually reducing the amount of recess in favor of no child left behind. It's good intentions gone wrong. It's the, it's the, uh, the, the fact that 
the law of unintended consequences can keep, uh, take over. We have this objective of making sure we teach our kids, but we do something like reducing the amount of, of playtime for them, and that has other effects on our kids uh, there. So the science shows that it's important for kids to play. And it's play with a variety of things and a variety of people. So at the museum, we like to say, it, it's, not, it's not only important that kids play, but it's what they play with, how they play, and most importantly, who they play with. Asking the parents to get involved in playing with their kids. And it's tough because these are difficult times. You've got two working homes. And what we do in the museum is to try to create a sanctuary where kids and parents can come in and play together. So that comes, takes us to our mission. It's to, to really support the importance of play and encourage the growth of imagination and social interaction across generations. We love it when we get child, parent, and grandparent together because they can all be looking at one item and relating over that same item because they all played with that item no matter where they were as kids. And we hope that by doing this, pointing this out, the importance of play, um, will make the community a better place. That our citizens will be better educated, they'll be more inspired to engage in play, and we'll just be a more joyful community. So that's really our, our lofty objective uh, of our little museum here. So I'm going to talk about five types of play. I'm going to inject with it some stories about toys. Uh, since this was the historical society, I tried to go into the history of some of these toys. If you've got questions, um, please feel free to, to ask out uh, here as we go along. But the first type of play we're going to talk about is called body and movement play. This is the type of play that gets the body engaged. How many of you have a pair of these yeah. <laughs> when you were a kid? This is a roller skate. This was the type you had to clip onto your shoe. You needed a skate key to attach them and make them work. That's a classic toy associated with body play. It gets the body moving here. When a child's sitting with an iPad, there's not a whole lot of body play going on other than a thumb or a forefinger or something like that uh, here. So it's through body play that kids actually learn flexibility, that causes their brains to think uh, differently, and they get adaptability and resilience. And, and body play can really take place in a lot of different ways. Now, this is that painting that Stuart Brown brought up. It's actually by a Dutch artist painted in 1492. And I'm going to call your attention to this little section right here in the bottom there. You see two grown-ups playing in the 1400s with something that looks a lot like this. Does anybody know what this really is? It's not a hula hoop. <laughs> it's actually, it's called a trundling hoop is what these were called. And here's some pictures of a trundling hoop. This first one is a mosaic tile taken out of a Byzantine cathedral in Turkey that dates back to the 6th century BC. And then here's a photo of some young boys in Toronto in 1922 also playing with a hoop. So this is a toy that's been around a long time. We don't see kids playing with one of these very often. But we're going to talk a little bit about the history of trundling hoops and how we as a museum deal with things. So when we come across an item like this, what's the first question we typically ask ourselves is, well, how old is this thing? And we'll take you through a little bit of an exercise of how we determine how old this item was. First thing we notice, and you can come up and take a look at that, is that on this hoop, there is the remnants of what looks like a price tag. And that price tag says, John Wanamakers of Philadelphia. Okay. So, I'm not a real big history buff around John Wanamaker, but I recognize the name Wanamaker, and I recognize and associate it to the Wanamaker Trophy, which is, I'm a golf fanatic, of the PGA Championship. So I looked up in the trusty internet about the Wanamaker Trophy, and I come to find out that it was donated by the son of John Wanamaker, who founded one of the first multi-level department stores in America. That's a picture of it. It was developed in 1869, and he was a real revolutionary in American, American retail. 
Really, up until then, there weren't massive department stores. You would go to a store for your millinery, you would go to a store for your groceries, store for toys. And uh, John Wanamaker operated a store just like this. It was really a men's clothing store. But he had the idea, rather than opening up a lot of different stores, I'm going to put them in one building. And what conveniently happened was, in Philadelphia, they built a new railroad depot, and the old railroad depot was available for next to nothing. Because what do you do with an old railroad depot? Well, he converted it into the first department store in 1869. So what else do we know? As I mentioned, he really did revolutionize uh, department stores in the country. He was one of the first to begin importing goods from France and offering really upscale. He was the Nordstrom of his time, if you will. He innovated a number of other things. Um, he was the first retailer to really establish price tags. Up until then, most retailers would not put prices on their goods. It was a bartering transaction, a negotiation that would take place between the salesperson and the buyer. And the salesperson's job was to get as much money he could out of that buyer. Well, John Wanamaker liked to say that he was a devout Presbyterian. And if we were all made equal in the eyes of the Lord, then we could all say, pay the same price. And so he was one of the first people to actually develop price tags there. But in doing the research, the real reason was he didn't want to have the salesman taking up time establishing the price. He wanted transactions to happen very quickly, so if the prices were set, people would just buy and then you would move on. The other thing I learned was that he was one of the first retailers to use gum-based adhesive price tags, which is what we have on this item here, and that he did that in the 1880s. The other information we have, uh, just from other research, is that the wooden hoops really began to disappear by the 1920s and they were replaced by pressed steel because there were other industries such as the bicycle wheel industry that popped up and they could pop these out much more easily than they could have them make out of wood. So that takes us, so we know our hoop can't be older than 1869 because that's when John Wanamaker first developed. We know 1888 is when he started using the adhesive price tags. And we know in the 1920s, the wooden hoops began to disappear and this, they were replaced with steel. So that way we can take our best guess and say this hoop was sold originally somewhere between 1890 and 1910, which makes it somewhere between 120 and 100 years old there. So it's in pretty good shape for that. So that's just a little step through history in terms of when we get an item like this, what do we do with it? The type of research we have to do, and I'm sure many of you here who work here in the Historical Society do something similar with the items that you come across. Next type of play we're going to talk about is called object play. This is where we find pleasure in the physical part of, of an object. Could be putting together a puzzle, could be kicking a ball, uh, through a goal, or if you're a grown-up, wadding that piece of paper up, pretending you're Wilt Chamberlain, throwing it in the waste paper basket. That's all a matter of engaging an object play. One of the oldest toys associated with object play is the building block. They have found building blocks in the pyramids. With, so they go back a long, long time. Ironically, the first evidence of putting alphabets on building blocks is until about the 1840s which is a little surprising to me. Um, so you don't need toys to engage in object play. How many of us have kids who discard the toy and <coughs> began playing with the box? <laughs> That's a form of object play uh, right there. So we're going to talk about a company who is really noted for creating toys that really were popular for object play. So has anybody here heard of the Hassenfeld Brothers Company? I didn't think so. So, um, what do the fabrics and the pencils have to do with Mr. Potato Head? Well, they're all part of the Hassenfeld brothers, and we'll walk you through that. In 1923, the Hassenfeld brothers started a business out in Providence, Rhode Island. They would go around to many of the large textile mills in New York, and they would go in and buy last year's remnant fabrics. Maybe the pattern has gone out, and they would go buy up all those, those remnants, and then they would resell them to the smaller textile companies who would take last year's fabrics and produce them this year. 
and it was a pretty good business. It allowed them to grow the business until in the 1940s they decided, you know what, we're going to make pencil cases and we're going to buy pencils from a manufacturer, put in those cases, and we'll sell them to school kids. Well, what happened, that business started off very positively, but what happened was the person who they were buying the pencils from raised the prices and they said, you know what, we'll start our own pencil company. The pencil company was much more profitable than the pencil case when they were in the pencil business. But when they did that, one of the three Hassenfeld brothers, um, he decided, you know, I really like the textile business. He actually left the company, gave it to his other two brothers, and actually went to work for another textile company. Big mistake. We'll tell you why. Because in 1949, Henry Hassenfeld, who had taken over the Comfort after his, uh, his brother uh, Hiram left, and uh, he decided to get into toys. In 1949, they introduced their first toy, and it actually sold really, really well. We'll show you a picture of that toy in a minute. And he was looking for the next toy to go grow his business, and he came across this in 1952. He met George Lerner, who had introduced this game, had taken it to this, this toy, had taken it to a toy exposition, and was looking for somebody to buy it. Henry Hassenfeld says, I'll buy the rights to the whole thing. And it became Mr. Potato Head. Now, in 1952, Mr. Potato Head was very different than it is today. You actually had to provide your own potato. <laughs> and it just had all the parts. In fact, I've only brought the box. We have a 1952 Mr. Potato Head on view at our, our museum. But you would poke these items into whether it be a potato or a carrot or an onion. And it was a huge hit. The kids loved it. Mothers started to complain because those kids that would clean up their toys would throw the potato and everything in the toy bin, and a week or two later, <laughs> so they had to change the design. But the Hassenfeld brothers had a big hit in Mr. Potato Head, so they decided to change their name. They decided to focus entirely on toys, and Hassenfeld brothers is what we now know as Hasbro Toys today. And of course, Hasbro still operates, still sells Mr. Potato Head, is one of the biggest toy makers in the country today. <coughs> That's a little object around, a, a history around an item associated with object play in one of the most popular toy companies in America. <coughs> so there are some other examples of object play. I'm sure many of you at one time have had one of these. It's the slinky. The Slinky uh, was invented by a gentleman by the name of Richard James. And Richard James was not a toy inventor. He was actually a mechanical engineer. And in the 40s, in 1942, he was working at a shipyard looking for technology to mount what was then uh, delicate electronics on board ships. And he was experimenting with a lot of different types of springs. And when he was uh, working with one, he accidentally dropped it off the ladder he was on. And he saw that spring roll over itself. And he got this idea that, you know, maybe that could become a toy uh, or a novelty. And the first slinky was introduced in 1946 or some 47 like that. Because his challenge was, how do I find the right steel at the, with the right properties that I could still sell this for a dollar, is what he sold this for, and make money. So he got a contract with uh, the Gimbel's department store. Um, they were going to give him a small little table of space. His wife, who was doubtful, you know, was very nervous but supportive of her husband. And the way it worked at Gimbel's, he was going to be given a little bit of shelf space. And if his items sold, then Gimbel's would buy more and resell them. So his wife was so nervous that the husband's invention would be a failure. She actually gave many of her friends a dollar bill to go down to Gimbel's to buy one. <laughs> but when the friends got there, they couldn't get to the counter because Richard James was selling these like crazy. Because he had, he had participated so late, Gimbel's had pushed him way down to the end, and he was able to set the boxes up and let people see that slinky walking down the boxes, and people were just giving him dollar bills left and right. And Slinky became a, a very, very big hit. So that's kind of how Slinky, which is a great object toy, came to be. There is a, a, an interesting 
continuation of the story that, uh, for the interest of time, I'll, I'll pass here, but if you come to the museum, we'll give you the whole story. There's a lot of overlap from one toy it can be an object play toy, but it can also go into being an imaginative or a creative play toy. Here you see pictures of two examples of imaginative uh, toys. Dolls typically will fall into this category. Here you see the ever popular Barbie, but this is the career series Barbie. So the kids could actually imagine themselves through Barbie being in different careers. Um, one of the earliest toys for letting kids imagine themselves in a different reality were things like the doctor's kit. This is that 1949 doctor's kit that was the first toy that the Hassenfeld brothers put out as an example. So those are clear examples of uh, create imaginative and creative play toys. So I thought I'd walk you through a story about this company here, Fisher Price Toys. Um, what oftentimes goes in imaginative and creative toys are toys that we call sensory toys. Toys that engage young kids through their senses here. It's that first thing that builds imagination there. And this is something Fisher Price is really, really good at. The interesting thing about Fisher Price Toys is they were founded in the 1930s by Herman Fisher, Irving Price, and Helen Schell. So I want to know why it's not Fisher Price Shell toys, but anyway, Herman, Herman and Irving are the ones who got their name on the toys. The way the toy uh, business came about, because this is 1930, the country's still mired in the Depression at this point in time. Um, Herman and Irving knew each other. Herman was uh, a buyer for F.W. Woolworths. He was buying merchandise for F.W. Woolworths, so he knew a lot about how to retail things. One of his suppliers was Irving Price, who would make novelties for the store. They partnered with Helen Schell, who operated one of the largest toy stores in upstate New York. So she could kind of give them an idea of what type of toys parents would buy, no matter how bad the economy was. And her steering was to build toys for these young kids, because no matter how bad times are, parents will want to find a way to get their kids some toys. So in the 1930s, uh, they, through the garage, cobbled out 16 different wooden toys that were, look a lot like the toys you see today, bright primary colors, things that a child could turn, tactile feedback of clicking and sound or music. And they created and took those 16 toys to that same toy fair that George Lerner was at, who brought the Mr. Potato Head, and it was an immediate hit. They got countless orders for those 16 uh, toys in 1930. The interesting thing about them is that here we are in 2016, and the vision for Fisher Price toys hasn't changed. They still target their toys at this age group, even though that company has changed hands several times. Um, every time it's changed hands, they've insisted they stay true to the formula, and it's still to this day one of the most popular. Imaginative, imagination to uh, play for. So, we can't skip dolls. So we'll talk a little bit about Mattel toys. Does anybody know who Barbara Millicent Roberts is and who comes from Willows, uh, Wisconsin? And where is Willows, Wisconsin? Anybody know the answer to that? Barbara Millicent Roberts is better known as Barbie. Because in 1959, when Mattel was introducing Barbie, they weren't sure it was going to be very popular because it was the first doll of its type. Up until 1959, all dolls for children were baby dolls or little girl dolls. There were no dolls that looked like this in 1959. So they weren't sure it was going to sell. So they actually engaged with Random House to produce a line of children books that published the entire backstory of who Barbie was. Her real name was Barbara Millicent Roberts. She hailed from Willows, Wisconsin, and talked about her high school, her boyfriend Ken, etc. And clearly the books became unnecessary. As soon as Barbie hit the stands, it was really a, a smashing success. So I'll tell you a little story about how Barbie came to be. She certainly is one of the most defining toys for Mattel, but a little bit about Mattel first. Mattel was founded in 1945 in El Segundo, California, when Matt Matson and Elliot Handler, Han Handler, Matt and El, that's how they came up with the name Mattel, they formed a small woodworking company. That company made doll furniture and picture frames for kids and things like that. But shortly after the company was formed, Matt Matson sold the company 
to Elliot and his wife Ruth because his health was beginning to fail. And he also wasn't really keen on the direction that Elliot wanted to take the business in, moving away from doll furniture more towards toys. So he sold the company to Ruth and to uh, Elliot. Another big mistake, <laughs> if you will. Because in 1955, Ruth became very active in the company, and she convinced her husband, Elliot, that there was this new television program. Television was still fairly new. It was called the Mickey Mouse Club. And that perhaps Mattel could benefit if they were one of the sponsors of the Mickey Mouse Club. And that sponsorship would then spawn the toys that they would create for the commercials to go on Mattel, and it caused Mattel to grow greatly. Uh, in 1956, Ruth and Elliot were vacationing in Europe, and they had their daughter Barbara with them. And when they were in Europe, they saw this doll right here. Does it look familiar? That's not a Barbie doll. That's actually called a Lily doll. It was made by a German company, O&M Hauser Company. And it really wasn't built as a toy. There was a very, very popular cartoon in one of the German newspapers that was syndicated across Europe called Lily. And it was a little bit of an adult-themed, racy cartoon. And the dolls were really made for the fans of the cartoon, not really for kids. So they didn't sell a lot of these dolls. They were typically sold in like tobacco shops as opposed to toy shops. But they, while they were vacationing in Europe, they saw this doll. The little daughter, Barbara, <coughs> fell in love with the doll. Ruth brought, bought six examples of this doll. When she got back home to El Segundo, California, she told her engineers, make me a doll like this. This was in 1956, and in 1959, that doll appeared, which is, of course, the doll we know as Barbie. If you look, there's a striking resemblance between the two. If you look at the curve on this hand, and you compare it to the curve on that hand, it's almost identical. What uh, Ruth didn't know, though, was that Owen Hauser actually had obtained three patents associated with the Lily doll. Those patents were associated with the way the hair was put on, the way the head was attached to the body, and the way the legs were attached to the body. Well, the Mattel engineers copied all three items. So in 1960, just as Barbie doll was starting to become popular, Owen M. Hauser filed a complaint against Mattel and sued Mattel. And it was pretty clear Mattel was going to lose that lawsuit in court. So Mattel uh, made an offer to O&M Hauser, who hadn't sold a lot of these dolls. They were sold in, the ones made in Germany were probably less than 100,000. They had licensed it when Barbie became popular and started producing them in Europe. It sold maybe hundreds of thousands. But they sold the rights to the Lily doll to the Mattel company for, anybody have a guess how much money Mattel had to pay? $21,000 is all Mattel had to pay for the rights <laughs> to the Barbie doll. Oh my God. And so consequently, once they bought the Hauser Company, the production of the Lily doll ceased entirely. And it's very difficult to find a German-made <coughs> Lily doll. The photograph you see of this doll is actually a doll we have in the museum. We're fortunate to have one of the few pre-1956 uh, Lily dolls, which was the inspiration for the Barbie doll there. So, we'll keep moving along. Social play. Um, this is a really important aspect when it comes to kids because it's social play that really begins to set our social confidence level as kids or adults. What is social play? This is the type of play where you're actually engaging with other people. Um, Social play can take place, take, you know, occur in a lot of different ways. Um, roughhousing as a kid. This is important uh, because kids learn the difference between real fighting and play fighting. Um, friendship and belonging. Beginning to develop empathy for others. Knowing what it feels like to win and knowing what it feels like to lose. Celebratory and ritual play. Birthday parties, for example. It binds people together. And this is something that when kids are engaged in an electronic device, they're not engaging in a real social engagement. It's a virtual social engagement. And so again, at the museum, we try to, to expose parents to these types of toys, which gets kids playing together. 
uh, there. I brought a few examples uh, here. So Chinese checkers, here's an example of a Chinese checkerboard right here. This one's from, I believe it was 1938 here. And it looks uh, surprisingly a lot like that one up there. So you would think with a name like Chinese checkers that they must come from China. Well, reality is no. Chinese checkers did not originate in China and they really aren't like checkers. Uh, the reality is the game in the star format originated in Germany in about the 1800s, but the same principal game has existed in Africa and the Middle East going back centuries. So it's a game that's been around a long, long time. A gentleman by Bill Preston was on uh, touring Europe looking for ideas. He again was a toy uh, manufacturer. He built, re made greeting cards, mostly paper products, uh, paper dolls, things like that. He was looking for something new. He saw the game and the star pattern there, um, and he got this idea he'd bring it back home. So in 1928, he adorned it with the oriental dragon pattern, because in the 20s that was a very popular theme. And Bill Pressman is the one who coined the term Chinese checkers, and just because of the way it played. And it became an instant hit. And it's still popular to this day, we still sell the game uh, today, but it is a great example of a social play game. Kids learn how to interact with one another there. Next one is storytelling and narrative play. And again, almost any toy can be used in storytelling or narrative play. I brought one example here, which you may all have had at one time. This is called the Topsy Turvy doll. This is usually engaged in storytelling play. It's through this doll. This doll was actually invented in the 20s at about the time of the Great Depression when parents couldn't afford a lot of toys. So with this one doll, a child could tell the entire story of Little Red Riding Hood with the one doll. Then you could talk about Grandma here, and then you could flip this around and talk about the big bad wolf. So with one doll, you could tell the entire story of Little Red Riding Hood, and it's a perfect example of a storytelling or a narrative play doll. There, I'm going to set that down. You can take a look at that. But we'll segue and talk a little bit about the ideal toy company because um, they made a lot of dolls that would be used in storytelling. They made a lot of plush figures. And we'll talk a little bit about how the Ideal Toy Company came to be. Um, it started in 1898 uh, in a little storefront on 404 Hopkins Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. Morris and Rose, they were Russian Jewish immigrants, uh, had come through Ellis Island just a couple years earlier and were able to open this small candy shop. Uh, Morris would sell, man the store uh, down below, and, and Rose, they lived above, would make plush toys to also sell uh, with their candies. And then um, their lives would change. So that's again what 404 Tompkins Avenue still exists today. I, I actually went there because I was just curious as to well, what's there today. And ironically, there's a toy store next door to them. <laughs> but 404 Tompkins, it's a small little store, and you can just imagine what it was like for um, Rose and Morris. So in 1902, their lives would change uh, significantly when they were inspired by this cartoon. Uh, young Teddy Roosevelt had become president uh, because of the assassination of McKinley, and he was a frontiersman. The story was that it appeared in the New York Times that he was in Mississippi to go bear hunting, could find no bears, the handlers found a bear cub, tied it to a tree, and invited Teddy Roosevelt to shoot the bear, and Teddy said, no, I can't shoot the bear this way. And that was popularized through this cartoon, Drawing the Line in Mississippi. And the, the Mitchums saw this uh, and were inspired, and so Rose immediately began to make little stuffed bears. And they called them teddy bears. And the teddy bear was born in America. And it changed their life completely because uh, by 1910, they no longer were in the candy business. They were fully in the toy business. This is a print from a 1910 advertising. You can see that those bears would sell for 79 cents to $1.19. 1910, that was a lot of money still, though, uh, there. Um, and that's really how Ideal Toy and Novelty Company was born, was with the teddy bear. Ideal Toy and Doll Company would go on to make 
over 150 different dolls uh, there. And they were the largest seller of dolls until about 1960. And who do you think, which doll do you think kind of knocked Ideal off the doll champion pedestal? Barbie. Barbie. <laughs> it was that Barbie, that Barbie doll. After that, uh, I mean, Mattel had a huge advantage. They only had to make one doll, whereas Ideal Toy had 150 different dolls that they would try to make and sell. It was just kind of a manufacturing uh, nightmare. And so Ideal then began to go from dolls into a variety of other things. But on the back table, right behind you there, you see an example from 1948 of an Ideal Toy doll. That's called a Tony doll. Um, and that, that doll is uh, from 1948 and still in very, very good uh, condition. But that's an example of the kind of quality dolls that, that Ideal, a toy company, made. And we have a wide variety of, of Ideal toy co company dolls uh, at our museum again. So, those are the five different types of play that we talked about. Let's talk a little bit about how do we try to achieve uh, our mission here. One way we do that is we don't just have things in cases to look at. We engage kids and adults and their parents in workshops uh, one Saturday per month. Uh, those workshops have a variety, variety of different themes. We had a superhero week where the kids get to draw and create their own superhero, talk about what superpowers they would like, and then engage and tell those stories with their parents. We've had pioneer days, those sorts of things. Lego toys. Um, we collaborate with a uh, collector of Lego, and we have the only historical Lego uh, museum within the United States. We have items that I'll show you some pictures here in a minute that only, the only other place you can go to see them is at the Lego Museum in Dillon, Denmark, uh, there. So we have these Lego workshops because they're a very popular toy. They're a great object-based toy. They drive construction. They build, it's a social toy. Kids work together. Uh, so we, we have these big Lego workshops here. And then we have a collection. What's amazing is neither my wife nor I were collectors of toys or dolls when we started this. Um, and so what we've learned about toys and dolls have just been over the years of people bringing us their collections to share in the museum. Oftentimes they're donated, sometimes they're loaned to us, but we have probably over 2,000 items, but unfortunately we can only display about 120 of them at a time in our small museum, so we have to rotate them out. But we have items that span, it says 120 years there, but we probably got some items much older than that. We have a what's called a Parian doll, a U.S. made doll that's basically a type of wax doll that's probably closer to 150 years old there in the museum. So that's one way we engage, uh, uh, look at achieving our mission. The other way is really by working with the community. Uh, this is a woman who came into our museum, saw what we were doing and said, hey, I have collected dolls from around the world. Um, would you like it to display them? And so we created an international doll display where we put the dolls from different countries and we would have schools come in who the kids would learn about, hey, what do the people dress like? There's a little globe next door. They would understand where in the world those dolls came from. Uh, so we work with the community in, in bringing kind of their collections that they're passionate about, sharing that with everyone else as well. We like to think we're small but mighty. As I said, we, are, we have the only rare historical collection of Lego toys. Uh, we also have an interactive uh, aspect to that part of the museum where we have a film that highlights the history of a Lego company. Um, we have knowledgeable docents who like to talk about what we do. I love sharing these stories. We may get an item from uh, someone's donated item that may not be an especially valuable or rare toy, but what makes it so special is the life story that goes with that doll or with that toy, how it meant something. And we just love sharing those stories. It keeps uh, those toys uh, alive uh, in a way. There, we rotate exhibits. We have seasonal exhibits. Uh, right now we have a, um, a motor vehicle exhibit uh, and we're changing over to, I think, a celebrity doll exhibit. Um, I mentioned that we have the, the uh, Lego Museum. This is an example where we will get guest builders. So the gentleman who brought these items in was actually a model builder for Lego, Legoland. And what he would do is take some of the creations that he would build in huge scale, and he would bring them in in small scale so that we could show them. 
And then he would come in and from time to time and talk to the kids about how he builds these items there. So the most common question we get about something like the geisha belt is, is it hollow? And the answer is no, it's solid Lego. In order to kind of make the features, you've got to make it entirely out of Lego there. So this is the way most people know Lego, is through the Lego bricks. But what they don't realize is that in the 1930s, when the company started, they actually started as a wood toy company. And we have uh, one of the largest collections of early wood Lego wood toys uh, in America. And this truck, as an example, is one of the first toys that Lego actually began making. There are only two versions of this truck known to be in existence. One is in the Lego Museum in Denmark, and the other is in Powell. So we're really proud to have uh, worked with this particular collector to bring that uh, display to life. This is the motor vehicle exhibit. Uh, the story that goes, I mean, no vehicle in here is especially uh, valuable, but again, it was the story about a father and son who had collected these cars together over a long period of time, and how, through toys, father and son had something to bond over here. So the cars are great to look at, but the stories are even better. Um, these are some examples of doll displays that were donated to us by people who were avid. This is a Ginny doll. It comes from the 1950s. Um, it was uh, made by the Vogue Doll Company. And it's kind of a unique doll in the sense that it's, a, it's an odd size. Most dolls were 8 to 12 inches tall. These dolls would stand about 5 inches tall. So it makes it a little difficult to build these kind of vignettes. But the artist who did these, and we have several of her vignettes, they're just really amazing, and uh, her name is Linda Rees, and Linda was a child of the 50s, and during her working life, she worked as a set decorator for J.C. Penny Furniture. So when they needed to bring the ball lineup, she's the one who would design what the layout would look like. Well, when she retired, she didn't stop. She just started doing it in miniature. But she then brought her love for the 50s, because all of her displays have a real 50s theme to it, so it's really fun to look at. And we have probably eight or nine different vignettes uh, of the Ginny dolls that you're, you should come down and take a look at. Um, we then have other dolls. These are dolls from uh, the Madame Alexander Company. And some of you may have collected Madame Alexander dolls or bought them for your kids. But the Madame Alexander Doll Company was started in, I think, 1923. Uh, we like to talk about Madame Alexander because it was actually a company founded by a woman. Uh, who she, because of the popularity of her dolls, then in the 30s and 40s inspired a number of other women to set up their own business manufacturing their own dolls. She was really one of the early feminists, if you will. But she had, had stumbled onto a really clever idea in the sense that she would build collectible dolls. Her dolls um, would basically have all the same body, all the same face. She would just change the outfit, the hair color, etc. And she would do it in themes, so she would license uh, the rights to produce dolls for Gone with the Wind. And of course, children would want to collect all the characters. And the neat thing for her was they were really all the same doll, they just had different outfits on. So from a manufacturing standpoint, it was very easy and affordable to build. And because of the collectible aspect, it really got uh, the customers hooked. And to this day, Madame Alexander Company uh, still exists uh, today. The example you see here is a fairly rare set of her Dion quintuplets. She would actually put out dolls to celebrate things in history. Of course, the Dion quintuplets were the uh, first surviving natural-born quintuplets. Uh, they were born in 1932, and she produced a variety of doll series, and we have a, a couple of different sets of the Dion quintuplet dolls. So, you can learn more about us. Uh, we have a Facebook page. We have a blog page. You can get to all of it through our, our website uh, there. And there, if you're, if this is something, if, if something we've talked about has kind of piqued your interest, there are other toy companies, just none in San Diego, toy, toy museums. Uh, our inspiration really comes from the Strong Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. It's a huge, huge museum, entirely dedicated to toys, dolls, and play. They actually uh, uh, host the National Toy Hall of Fame uh, at the, uh, the Strong Museum there. We collaborate and work very closely with the many of these museums. We share displays uh, with them. The Denver Museum of uh, Miniatures and Toys uh, donated a very, very elaborate dollhouse miniature uh, to us that we have on display uh, there that we're really proud that the, they helped uh, kick us off uh, with that. So as always, 
we look for your support. Come visit us. Uh, we, again, as I mentioned, we only exist for the benefit of the community, and we only exist if the community engages with us here. So I'll, I'll end it there and just open up if there are any questions about toys, dolls, uh, whatever I may have said that piqued the question or interest. Yes, ma'am. I remember a series of dolls called uh, Storybook Dolls. Yes. My sister and I had. So I think they were 10 or 12 inches tall. Nancy Ann Storybook Dolls, she was inspired by Madame Alexander. Her company came out in the 1940s. Uh, she had a variety of different size dolls. The ones that were the most popular were about four and a half inches tall, and then she had a set that was about eight inches tall. But the smaller ones are the ones that were really the most collectible, and we've got a great assortment. And then there were a number of copies that came out after that. There was a series called the Hollywood Dolls that looked almost identical to them, slightly different. But again, it was another company founded by a woman. So those are three companies, Madame Alexander, Nancy Ann Storybook Dolls and the Hollywood Dolls that were all women-owned and driven businesses. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> you first. Yeah, you first. Was that an Alexander named after somebody? Where did they come up with the name? That's an interesting story. Uh, Madame Alexander was from New York. Her real name was Bertha Alexander, and she began making these dolls, and she called them the Madame Alexander Company. Uh, as the company became popular and she began to have to appear in public, she did not want to be introduced as Bertha Alexander, so she actually changed her name to Beatrice Alexander, and she was always introduced as Madame Beatrice Alexander uh, as the company. So it, it was a person, it was Beatrice Alexander, but it, the interesting backstory is how she was just a normal person like you and I named Bertha, but as the company became bigger, she had changed her name to fill out the persona of Madame Alexander. And she only passed away in the 1990s uh, here, so she was active in running the company from its uh, foundation in 23. Uh, it had been bought and sold a couple of times, but it's always operated as an independent line, and I don't recall who the owners are now, but it's not owned by one of the bigger toy companies there. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. You know, I could never understand why the German style teddy bears were so valuable or popular. I think they're the ugliest. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have a great teddy bear display. Um, again, we're small, so we have to limit things. But we have a nice selection of teddy bears. We have a great teddy bear enthusiast. And we have both stiff teddy bears and the ideal teddy bears. But in fact, the oldest teddy bear we have on display is a 1918 uh, ideal, one of the original teddy bears. And you can compare the two, and they're, they're, you can begin to understand the, the difference uh, in them. And, you know, uh, it's all up to people's taste. There was a bit of a battle raging in the, the uh, 1920s over who really coined the term teddy bear, because Stife actually claimed they began calling it teddy bear. And we don't know exactly what the truth is. We think both companies began calling it teddy bears, probably inspired by that same cartoon of Teddy Roosevelt there. Yeah, but I was wondering if it was a method, how it was made, why it became so popular. I mean, there's nothing, nothing attractive about that bear. The, the, the Stife teddy bears were really popular because the early ones were made out of uh, mohair. They were very finely crafted. They were jointed. And they weren't sold in great quantities here, so they just be, kind of became a very collectible uh, item, uh, more or less so than anything. Whereas te the ideal bears that were made here in the country, um, they're still very, very collectible, but if you were to compare the values between the stifes and the ideal, the stifes probably are worth a little bit more. Yeah. So, yes, sir. I remember as, as a child of the 50s, I remember building plastic model ships, you know. Did that evolve out of carving wooden ships at some point, or when did that, with the plastic models of the sure. early 50s? Or sure. The, the, the innovation of, well, to answer your first part of your question is that yes, there were a number of kits, both airplanes and ships, where they would be sold as kits made out of balsa wood. Kids would have to cut the balsa wood, carve the balsa wood, fit them into models. And we actually have on display in the museum a number of balsa wood and tissue airplanes that were made in the 50s. Uh, they're on display. But you're right, they began to move away from wood into plastics, frankly, late 50s into the early 60s there. So, yes, sir? Did you mention Monopoly at all? Monopoly, Parker's Brothers, uh, one of the clear popular games came out in the 20s uh, there. Um, 
I, about all I can tell you is it still remains one of the most popular family board games. I think last time I read, it has been the highest selling board game of virtually every board game because it's been out for so long. Interesting uh, story of um, Parker Brothers and um, it was Parker Brothers and I think Hasbro bought Parker Brothers and then Tonka bought Hasbro <laughs> and then Tonka was then bought by I can't I think it's uh, might be Mattel. So even though the Hasbro name is out, it's now owned by, I believe it's Mattel, I could be mistaken on that, but many of these companies, they consolidated over time, and I found it interesting that Hasbro wound up buying Parker Brothers, and then both those companies wound up getting bought by Tonka, and mm -hmm. Tonka wound up getting bought by some. Um, we do have a 1940s version of the Erector set. This, one of the stories we love talking about really is uh, the founder of the company, the, of the Erector set, uh, a gentleman by the name of Gilbert, because oh, yeah. Gilbert was an interesting man. He was actually a trained medical physician. Um, he was also an Olympic gold medalist, uh, but he chose to make his living as a magician. And at one point in time in his career, he opened a little, little novelty shop selling magic tricks. And as the story goes, he was watching an elevated railroad being built outside of his building, and he was intrigued about the beams that were going up to suspend the electric cables. And he borrowed a thousand dollars and began to make the erector set. And the erector set was the most popular toy for boys up until oh, yeah, about really. 1960 there. And so we do have a, uh, a complete uh, erector set from the 40s uh, there. Tinker toys as well. Those are all construction based toys. Uh, erector sets began to fall off in popularity in the 60s because of the advent of plastics. It just became much cheaper to begin producing plastic toys. So, anybody else? Well, thank you very much for uh, letting me uh, stop the